I want to begin uh, with some introductory remarks about the fact that Vatican II as such can really be called a missionary council. When we think of the mission of the church uh, in the documents of Vatican II, uh, we almost spontaneously would think of its document on mission. It's not its, its decree on the missionary activity of the church, uh, or as it's called after the, the first two uh, words of the document, uh, gentes. This is certainly correct. However, mission and evangelization, or mission or evangelization, I think it's the same thing in, in my mind, really goes through all the documents of the council and, and through many, many aspects of the, of, of the council as well. And I would say and argue that at its deepest level, Vatican II was really a, a, a missionary council. The central theme, of course, of Vatican II uh, was the mystery of the church, uh, that the church is a sacrament, a sacrament of salvation, uh, a sacrament of Christ's presence in the church. But as the very first paragraph in the um, uh, in the document on the church says that when we talk about the church as a sacrament, we mean that it is both a sign and an instrument of salvation in the world. So you have right away this idea that the church is not just about itself. It's not just to be a, it's not just to be a community, a sign of unity and a sign of salvation, but it is to reach out into the world and make that uh, salvation visible and present in the world through, uh, its, uh, through its activity. Now, unlike previous councils, and I've said this uh, a bit before in, in the, the, the uh, presentation that I gave in our, at, our first, uh, at our first lecture, that into was not called uh, to attend to a crisis of doctrine or structure. Not at all like the situation of the Council of Trent, when Europe was really rent apart uh, by, the, by the, the efforts of the, of the Protestant Reformation, Luther and Calvin and so forth. Not even like at, in 1870, when Vatican I was called, when the church was really struggling uh, with the emergence of science and democracy and other issues of the, of, of the modern world. But John XXIII, in a move, I think, of really genuine prophetic insight, called the council to help preserve Christian doctrine in times of immense political and social change in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of, of, excuse me, political, social, and cultural change in the middle of the 20th century. Remember we talked about a tournamento, the updating, uh, the making uh, the, the, the doctrines of the church and the message of the gospel more acceptable uh, for contemporary people, at least I should say really more understandable for contemporary people. Uh, John XXIII called for a change uh, that, that, the, uh, that the substance of the faith always remains the same, but we really have to work at, 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 at its expression in a new age and a new time with new problems. John XXIII called for change but not for change of sake, but for the sake of the gospel, so that the gospel could be preached, so that the church could really be that sign and that instrument of salvation in the, uh, in, in the contemporary world. 
As Johannes Schutte, um, the superior general at that time um, of um, my own congregation, the Society of the Divine Word, and the one, as you'll see, who really was able to push the document on mission through the council. He said in a, in a uh, or wrote in a, um, an article he wrote after the council, that mission is really what gave the council its basic direction. It's kind of like the underlying uh, motive for John the Twenty Third's calling of the council, uh, and for and for all the councils working as well to make the gospel more accessible, more challenging, more understandable in the in the modern world. Now. Each of the four constitutions, remember we talked in my, my first presentation about the most important documents, if you can say that, were these four constitutions, the constitution of the church, the church in the modern world, the constitution of liturgy, uh, and also the constitution of divine revelation. Each of the four constitutions, you can say, have a kind of a missionary dimension to them as well. So, for instance, in the Constitution of the Church, I've already mentioned several times this whole idea uh, that the Church sees itself right in the beginning uh, of, of the document as the sign and instrument of God's salvation in the world. In paragraph 5 of the Constitution of the Church, there's a subtle but really important um, uh, a remark that the council makes, it talks in a very subtle way about the difference between the church and the reign of God. That the church should not be identified with the reign or the kingdom of God, but that the church gets its whole identity from its preaching about the reign of God, its witnessing to the reign of God, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and its service of the reign of God. 